Good morning if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook. Just so you know, we're live when we record these. So you could go to our Facebook or YouTube channels and watch these live if you're <laughs> watching them later or listening to them. Anyway, my name is Richard Wilmore, and I am your host of Arts for the Health of It. And I'm Constanza Rader. I'm your other host. You can see all the shenanigans and the, the pre-edit shenanigans that go on on our podcast when you watch live. Um, let's be honest. We usually leave the shenanigans in even, af even after the fact before we post well, What it. we're going to start doing is recording it right from the as time as <laughs> our guest gets here. Because there's have... so much. This is why we're always late. We're supposed to go live at 10. It's 10.10. 10, and we've been talking and laughing. And none of it's been recorded. I know. We have so much fun as soon as people come on. And we it's so much we're gonna have so much fun with Claude Larson today we're excited to have her joining us she's um a visual art or she does art and she has a goal to really make art inclusive um and works with people from all different backgrounds who may not be able to fully participate in a normal art class and she, she's going to be talking with us about that um I, we're not going to do much ado about this i'm going to read her bio and we're going to bring her out because she's a hoot we're going to have a good time uh claude is an artist with other two decades of experience working with textiles paint and collage she also facilitates workshops for adults and youth in the general population as well as those with developmental disabilities and brain trauma her approach to art is accessible to all, and she feels that expression through art is a powerful bridge for people who might otherwise be excluded from traditional classes. And with that, let's start the show. Come along with me, and I know you'll see that a song changes everything. Was that a better transition, Stancy? Yes, that was okay. so nice. Thank you, Richard. Re edit of the intro video because Stancy's not happy with it. So <laughs> I came this close to getting me. fired, everyone. And wow. I, I, mean, I don't think maybe. Your job was no. hanging by a thread. It, Thank goodness for that video. I felt like I was on that bridge behind you, dangling for my life. <laughs> I what love this bridge. I love for those of you listening, she has this beautiful painting. Is it a painting or a picture? It, you know what? Th this is really funny. Um, I'm a I'm a Reiki master. Oh, and this used that. to be the room when I had clients um, that would. I, I now work um, outside of my home, but when I had a home, uh, you know, setting in order to treat clients, this was that room. And I saw this picture. It's huge. Just so you know, it's like five foot by seven foot. It's like it wow. probably looks like an eleven by fourteen here, but it's really big. It takes up. A lot of room and i and i bought it at ikea, IKEA. no I way yeah yes. that's an ikea and, i could tell yeah, right away it's yeah. totally I've seen it yeah, it's totally it's ikea nice. and i was like obsessed and i kept looking at it because i i love ikea it's there because they're super organized and i'm like wow if my kitchen looked like this oh i know but, um but i brought it home not really sure what I was going to do with a five foot by seven foot painting. This is me jumping off a bridge. Right. And um, it, I ended up designing the entire space where I was treating people around this photograph. So I have like, you know, there's wooden elements in, in here. The colors are very um, like atmospheric. I want to hmm. say and it was really just based on this. And I love it. And honestly, people would get up off the table. Anybody who has ever experienced any type of energy healing, when you when you sit up from the from the table, a lot of times like your your head is in a very different space. And they're like, whoa. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I love it. And it is it is my constant reminder to try new things, take risks. Because, and let me see if I tip my laptop, you will see on the other side, right, there's a tree there, mm -hmm. and but there's there's this very misty, uh, ethereal kind of feel to it. And you're like, you're not exactly sure where this bridge ends, what's on the other side, what you're going to find there. And so I use it as just a reminder to myself that, you know... You, if you want something really special, it might require taking a risk, getting out of your comfort zone and, you know, take, putting one foot in front of the other. So 
Mm, that could I love be an symbolism. entire episode in itself of like writing the story of what's on the other side of that bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh. Absolutely. Every season, we're in season two now and everybody on season one, we said, we're gonna, just going to bring you back in season two because we have more. But now I feel like I want to bring you back in season three and do a whole writing thing with you. Okay. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Sorry. <laughs> Booked. <laughs> Booked. Um. Yes. So can you tell everybody uh, what you do and why you do it? Sure. Um, so what I do is I am all about creating visual art. I mean, I've also written a book and, you know, done other things, but my real passion is visual art. I love to look at it, but I really love to be in it and making it. And this started 20 something years ago. Um, I was, I, I've all my life, I have been, I've learned how to sew from my mom at a very young age, grew up sewing, you know, the prom dress, the wedding dress, the house things, the clothes for your kids, like all the things. And one day I realized that I had very few, I was working full time. I had very few free hours. You know, I was raising kids. I was busy. I had very few free hours. Why am I using them to make something I could buy? Mm. So why am I making pants if I could buy pants? You know, like it, it didn't make sense. I wasn't hard to fit. And it was kind of like, this is silly. I'm going to throw away all my patterns talk about jumping off a bridge. I just was like, nope, check it. No more directions. I'm just going to play with fabric. And that's kind of how it started. Let me just put an, and I tried making a traditional quilt, got that quickly out of my system. It's all <laughs> about like, let's measure and make the things exactly meet. And it, I, I, I did not find that rewarding. And some people, obviously they love it. There's how many quilters out there and quilt magazines and books about it. And obviously it's a passion for many people, but the traditional route was not for me. So I start, just started playing with really no intention other than this is my free time. I really like this activity. I'm going to engage in it more often. Hmm. And of course, if you keep doing something over and over and over again, miraculously, you get better at it. Isn't that crazy? And um, I actually was making them for several years for myself, you know, giving them as gifts or whatever, sometimes <laughs> throwing them right in the trash. But one day somebody saw one of my pieces and she was like, um, how much do you want for that? And I thought, Oh, this is a thing that you can sell. I had no idea. I, I didn't know that where this, this is where this was going. And from that point on, it was like, oh, okay. You, you know, like I, I made up a price and she looked at me like, no, seriously, you know, what, how much, like it was way too low for what I had done in her opinion. And I thought, okay, well, no, I'm, I'm comfortable with that price. I'm happy with it. It was an experiment, you know, whatever. And from there it grew and grew and grew. Hmm. And from putting two pieces of fabric together, I went to collage, putting two pieces of paper together. And from there I started adding acrylic paint and like making my own collage paper. And um, it's really led me on this great journey, which I know is like overused, but Truly, it's it's like every day, the unknown in my studio, what will happen? Um, and because people were appreciating my work, they were asking me if I would teach workshops, which I started to do um, in a, you know, there was a small art venue nearby. So I was doing it there. And then somebody from that venue worked at a um a facility for people who had experienced brain trauma at all different parts of their lives. Like some of them, unfortunately, you know, drinking at prom and a car crash and like the rest of their life, they have brain trauma. Some of them, a motorcycle accident, a car accident, like whatever. So there were varying ages of people, but they were all adults and they, some 
had um, obviously cognitive uh, um, struggles because they had had this pretty traumatic brain injury. Some could speak, some couldn't. Um, and it, and it was just like, for me, I was like, sure, I could, you know, I could do this. What, why not? You know? And so I taught, I laid out a class and I said, okay, they, they can't work for like a three hour workshop span of time. Mm. So I said, we're going to do this one hour, you know, every Wednesday or whatever at this time, I'm going to come up once a week and every Wednesday for four weeks, I'm going to take them through the process rather than try to fit it in a three hour workshop. I just broke it down for them. And I knew if this takes a half hour, I'm going to allow an hour because by the time, um, you know, I explained it and then went around and made sure everybody understood it and all of that. And I want to say, I think there's like a dozen um, adults in this workshop and they all ended up making, creating their own collage paper and then using that to create their own collage, which I then like finished. I did like the fussy, like, you know, layers of mediums and, and varnish and all that. And then we had an exhibit where mm -hmm. they, some of the, I mean, it was so amazing because, you know, over this four week span of time, I had really gotten to see their personalities. One guy was like the Joker, you know, and the other one was super sweet. And like, she was just about like, uh, you know, pink and purple and sparkles, and you know, and then you see their work at the end and it was, it was their personality on a panel because they had worked on wood cradle panels. And in that moment, I realized like I could see their personality on the panel, but in that moment, I realized other people could see my personality when they look at my work. Cause when I look at it, mm -hmm. Oh, I made that. Oh, this is, you know, what I liked about that process or what I liked about that piece. But all of a sudden it was like, Oh, I get it. This is a piece of me. Just like their work was a piece of them. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, and it was, it was great. I mean, it was really great for me as a teacher because you have to really hone your communication they're not going to make assumptions they're not going to make a lot of leaps um you have to be very descriptive and at the same time allowing them freedom because they'd say well can i do this well let's mm -hmm. see well why don't you do that and let's see what happens well what do you think about what happened there do you like that Okay, great. Oh, you don't like that? Here's some more paint. Why don't you just paint it a different color? Or, you know, why don't you go on to the next piece of paper and see what happens? And they all of a sudden were like, oh, there's no rules here. There's no, I was like, you are limited by the materials you choose and the size of the paper you are currently working on. But beyond that, there are no limitations or rules here. And they got to trust and really by the end of the fourth week it was just really exciting they you know the local art gallery hung their work and they had an opening reception for them and you know the snacks and all the things and the people came and it was just it was delightful mm -hmm. i can't think of another word it was just delightful and after that experience i had the opportunity to submit to work with a group of developmentally disabled adults, they were a couple of counties away from me, which I don't know, it was maybe an hour's drive or so. And I submitted my application and they, you know, they called me on the phone and they were like, we're just curious why anyone would want to come drive an hour to like do this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, one, at the time I was a full-time teacher. I said, this opportunity happens in the summer. I have the time. I have the experience. And I just want to try this with a different population. And I did another um, make collage paper. Um, and they created a final product with me. And I went oh, several weeks in a row. I want to say, you know, probably two thirds of the summer, I would, we would go once a week and they were, they were of course 
you're a stranger on the first day on the second day when they're happy to see you that's always great and then by the end i mean it was hugs all around and um they were a very big organization they were it, it was called the way center and it was just about like bringing arts to people of all um abilities and what they did was they had other artists working with other groups from their facility and we did a big art show at a local community center and you know it was at night and then i feel like i think they auctioned off the art and the proceeds went to support the facility um but they were so excited to be there because it was really about them and you know they got dressed up and they came and we all took pictures together and um it was it was just so fun and even though um you know people might have thought like why did you do that and drive all that way like i got so much out of that it was just joyful they were happy and they were um childlike they weren't they weren't childish they weren't throwing tantrums they weren't you know annoyed with materials they were childlike they had no like what do you mean orange can't go with pink you know like they didn't mm. tell themselves these things and what we ended up making was um it was just really special i have um you know pictures of it i'm sure in my instagram feed you could find but really seeing them with the finished product and they were picking out like oh this was the part i did and this was the part i did and they were recognizing themselves in the work it was really nice it was a really fun experience hmm. wow. and i guess that leads me to a question about what what impact really this is kind of two two questions what impact do you see did you see arts that type of art um have on the participants and then what impact did that have on you as an artist? And you touched on this a little bit, but I wonder, wonder if you could dig deeper into that, because I think I th think there's a lot of um, good that it, that these types of um, arts and health uh, initiatives have on both of those, on the artist and on the participant. Uh, you're absolutely right. The um, I think for the participant, the nice thing is that they, you know, they have each other as a community and it tends to be somewhat sheltered. So now they're having experiences with people outside of their normal, you know, day-to-day -day interactions. And they start to realize that um, there's, there's, a lot of fun to be had out there. There's people to meet and some of them really come out of their shell mm. and, and art is sort of the medium for that to happen, right? Because I could go there and just have conversations with them, but they might be hesitant to speak with me or they might be nonverbal because some of them were, you know, that was their circumstance as well. So now it's, now we have this, I have now just created a common ground that we are going to both experience together. So it builds trust right away and it, and it creates a relationship that's, it's just really nice. Um, and for, for me, it was very eye opening because I worked, I was a middle school teacher and I taught physics and chemistry. So even though I love making art, I was, people were like, oh, you must have been an art teacher. No, I was not. Um, and so for me, working with this population, it was different from what I do every mm -hmm. day. And they, uh, I mean, just to be clear, if you think back on seventh and eighth grade in your life, um, what were you most concerned about? You know, what other people thought of you? was your outfit going to be cool that day? <laughs> Were you going to embarrass yourself in phys ed? You know, like they, they still are still have so, those thoughts. Yeah, they <laughs> are so, Apparently that was supposed to stop in eighth grade. Okay. <laughs> Talk to my therapist about that. Permission to put that down. Um, <laughs> but you know, they are so concerned about what other people think of them. And these 
folks are like, this is who I am. And they don't mm -hmm. worry about it. And that was so liberating for me because I, when I created artwork, I'd be like, will people like it? And I would worry about that. And I would ask myself that. And that I'm like, it doesn't matter because if we're all having fun and we're enjoying the process, literally there were those panels from those artists with brain trauma and it was their personality on a panel. And I thought, that's what I want. And I have kept that with me as I've moved forward because it's kind of like, yeah, this is a little piece of me. Not everything is for the general public viewing. Let's be honest, because there also has to be some elements of art if I'm going to put it out there. But it's very liberating to go in my studio and play. And um, I mean, the last series that I just did, I was like, okay, I'm going to scale up. I'm going to use this color palette. I'm going to do these things. Some of those paintings have 12 layers of paint on them because I was like, well, I'm just going to do whatever, see what happens. And then I would stand back and I'd keep going until I was like, well, I kind of like this. And then I'd put it to the side. I'd work on something else. Oh, okay. I'd get everything to where I kind of liked it. And then I'd figure out what do I like about it? Why do I like that? What do I need more of? What do I need? What, what doesn't need to be there? What can I paint right over? And um, so I just sort of edited it. And when I stand back and look at it, I go, wow, every single one of these is a reflection of me. Every one, like when it gets to the point where I love it and I stop, it's like, oh, now I see it. And mm. these adults that I was working with, it was like they saw it immediately because they didn't have the critic in their head telling them, is it good? Is it not good? They'd be like, no, I like it. I like it exactly the way it is. Okay. You don't want to add anything else? Yeah. You sure? Okay, great. Then there it is. Like, you know, the, it's done then. And they knew when it was done. And I, <laughs> that was so like refreshing for me. Cause even now I'll hang it on the wall. I'll think it's done, but I will never commit until at least the next day when I walk in and I go, Yep. Still love it. Don't want to add anything. Don't want to take anything away. Um, they just have a very immediate response. It's delightful. And it's, um, yeah, I appreciate it. I learned a lot from that. Mm. It's a great tip though, to not, I do that. Like I'm not a great painter, but I like to paint and and usually my stuff gets hung up in my garbage can, but to maybe like give yourself that space and that time to step away from it instead of just like, I have to do this. The, like it, the finished product that I do today has to be what I'm, what I'm happy with, but to walk away from it for a minute and think about it and look at it again, you know, once, once the paint fumes have <laughs> dispersed right. to go once back. You're you're getting full oxygenated brain. You know, <laughs> that yeah. Well, and it's funny because on my website, there's a picture of me uh, that my husband like snapped. Like we were in the basement. I said, Oh, this podcast, they need a picture of me. Can you just take it? Like, I'm going to paint and I'm going to do things and like, whatever. And at one point I just kind of turned around. And I was standing there, but it was like, that was what I look like. Like I was like, that's me. That's the shot. That's what I'm going to send them. And Behind me was the series I was working on. And I remember at the time thinking, wow, these are really coming along. These are really going somewhere. I like these. Yeah, that was like paint layer three. And when they're finished, they are now in my, they're now on my website. There is not one inch of anything that was on those paintings behind me that remains in the final paintings. Wow. So like, you know, you think to yourself, I'm just having fun painting hmm. like anybody. And I, that's where, you know, I mean, I work mostly non-representationally, mostly abstractly. And um, the thought of like sketching it out first and like having it have to look exactly like something it does not entice me to go into my studio and paint. It just feels like a lot of pressure. Mm. And um, this is like, I painted a layer and I get it out of my field. And at one point we, I had painted, you know, I'm into this series of paintings and I had them all drying. I had them like sort of laid out on paper on the floor. 
and I had them all drying and we, we went away. I want to say we were gone maybe like a week, my husband and I, and we come back and I remember thinking when we left, oh, I'm going to go down in that studio and they are all just crap. Like, <laughs> oh, these are so bad. We go away for a week. We come back. I walk down. I go, oh, no, wait, <laughs> these aren't that bad. These have potential. <laughs> like, these are going to be okay. Like, you know, you think of them, like these little fledglings. Are they going? Am I just going to like light them, you know, get the Zippo lighter and like, you know, burst into flame or are these going to go somewhere? And they, they ended up being my most recent series of paintings. And I was just kind of like, wow, I totally thought they were going to end up in the garbage, but um, I just kind of keep going. Yeah. I love that connection you made between like what you learned through your work with vulnerable populations and how that trans how that impacted your art making. And before we went live, we were talking with Catherine, who's behind the scenes right now. She's our producer today. Um, but we were talking about, you know, she was introducing herself and Catherine was saying, oh, I'm an I was an artist in residence with Hearts Need Art. And Claude was like, oh, what is that? So I think that's a good opportunity to, Catherine didn't know we were going to do this today. So she's, uh, but we're going to bring her on. Can and we take a break quick? Yes. Uh, after the this break. This is called a teaser. It's called a <laughs> <After> segue. <the> <laughs> yes. We're going to take a break and then right. we'll be back on with Catherine. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Minty Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at the power of music in our everyday lives through the lens of science and health, sports and entertainment, business and education. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. Unleash the power of music. Medical professionals are burning out at an alarming rate. Burnout can cause health workers to feel hopeless, trapped, helpless, worthless, depressed, sleepless, and tired. By joining the Hearts Need Art Gratitude Grams program, medical staff receive a personalized email and video from a musician, an artist, or writer once a week that includes a message of thanks, an encouraging song, uplifting poem, or a simple art activity. After watching their Gratitude Gram, participants report feeling more hopeful, empowered, energized and appreciated. If you are or know a healthcare worker that would like to receive free gratitude grams, please visit heartsneedart.org. All right, we're back. Oh, Catherine hasn't put herself in yet. She's afraid. There she is. Hi, there Catherine. She is. I have to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> So Catherine was an artist in residence with us um, for about a year, and then she had a move. She's now in Mississippi, and she just moved, and we're sad that she had to leave, <laughs> but she's now helping us with marketing and kind of producing our podcast and some other things, so we're glad she's still part of our team. Um, but Catherine, would you like to share about what an artist in residence uh, or a, an arts and health professional is? Sure. Um, so... Um, oh, Catherine, pull, yeah. pull your hair away from your microphone. Okay. Catherine, if you're, yes, if you're okay. listening, Catherine has a, this beautiful curly hair and <laughs> <laughs> it was encroaching it, on the mic. It needed to make, yeah, make an appearance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I'm not sure where to start, but um, basically with Hearts Need Art, um, we have artists, musicians, and writers that are trained by Hearts Need Art to go into um, hospital settings or medical settings and work directly with patients. Um, the patients that I mainly served were oncology patients. And so um, it depends on the hospital. Some hospitals, you can do window paintings. You can, you know, if they're not up for doing an art activity, you can create something on their window for them. Um, and then other other patients, um, we have projects prepared that we can bring the supplies into their room and do bedside art. So, Claude, I, I know you had questions before, so we can turn this into your uh, your you, interview. The interview. Ooh. If you have questions <laughs> for her, now is the chance. 
Right. So I have been, um, I've done a lot of things in the past 20 years on the art journey. And the one that I've really sort of got my hooks in right now that I'm researching and trying to find a good fit is an artist in residence experience. Um, you know, be that location. Like I'm not, I, I'm not really sure, but I read a lot of prospectuses and I submit and some of them I'm like, no, that's not for me. Um, so I was just curious, you know, what, um, what brought this to your attention? What inspired you to apply? Right. And what the experience ent entailed, like now you're telling us, okay, you were providing it in a medical setting. Um, but you know, how was that supported and, and, um, what did you get out of it? So I, I found out about it through um, a friend of mine. <laughs> she knew Stanzi and um, I had in my college years done an internship with um, an arts and health program for, with pediatric oncology. And so um, I had kind of a sense of that link between art and service. And that really, it, it was a long time ago that I did that, but it, it stuck with me. And um, I've never been like the big gallery artist um, that has my stuff everywhere all the time. Um, I admire people that do that. But for me, the, the connection to the arts through serving other people has always meant more to me. Um, and so seeing Hearts Need Art, it was like, this is... <laughs> This is like a dream come true. Right. Um, a perfect fit. Yeah. Right. And it. so um, there, I applied, uh, went through their interview process. Um, and when I was brought on board, the one of the things I love so much is that their orientation was so, um, it's just such wonderful training about how to enter and exit a room, how to interact with patients going through very difficult health situations. It's not, it wasn't just, we're throwing you into this <laughs> setting, good luck. Um, it was really trying to um, bring the care and um, just the, like the care and conscientiousness that you need when you're working with that population. Sure. Yeah. And artist in resident, artist in residence is a, is a term that's used in, and it can, means different things in different parts of industry. Um, you can have an artist in residence at a school or at a gallery or, you know, in different spaces. But in this field of arts and health, you know, people might be called artists in residence or arts and health professionals. And it might be a little bit closer to what someone might call a teaching artist, because generally they're actively engaging um, with a certain population in the arts and leading arts experiences, um, sometimes doing, sometimes creating art as well as part of that residency. You know, we've done murals and we've done, you know, well, the window paintings that Catherine talks about are these beautiful works of art that just live temporarily in a patient's room, but it's this beautiful, moral, these beautiful murals that they'll create at the guidance of the patient. Um, uh, but yeah, it's really kind of this unique, um, experience that isn't necessarily designed to advance someone's public art career, but really is for the people who really want to serve others and connect with others through, through the arts. Um, and, for, it, it, and that's what I love about it, you know, as a musician in healthcare, like it's the most meaningful work I've ever done. And it's, um, life changing. It's exactly what artists. you're doing. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and that's what you're doing, Claude. Exactly you know, what we're doing. <laughs> I mean, you I, didn't even know. And Add you it didn't to your know. Resume. Well, and what's funny is like, yes, I've had this artist in residency thing on my radar um, because I do want that experience of being free of other obligations and like I can just create and I don't have to think about like, you know, my husband or family members or commitments, none of that stuff. I could just go do this thing. And on, and the other half of me has this vision, I want to say at this point where I would love to get a collection of artists together, put on a show, but have each artist select their favorite 
um, local charity or nonprofit and a portion of your proceeds goes to that hmm. organization. Um, so I get that whole, like, yeah, that act of service. Like I get mm-hmm. that. I, and my thought is I could do it by myself, but if you bring in a community of other artists, you amplify it. Yeah. How, how wonderful. And if I have a particular nonprofit that speaks to me and you have a different one, you know, I know there's a way that we could figure this out that, um, you know, we're all in one collective place and lots of organizations would benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that makes, um, that's the impact I want to make because, I mean, I've already done it. I made a series um, and I donated the biggest in the series for an auction at a local nonprofit. The other ones are on my website. And when they sell, the proceeds are going to that organization. Hmm. So it's, it, you know, it was my act of service in a time when I was just very concerned about some world events and I felt compelled to do this. And I think when you do something like that and you bring others with you, it really widens the mindset of, of how could I be of service? Mm. Um, Cause artists can, you know, they can tend to get in their head. Um, same, you know, that happens to me too. And then I go, okay, stop taking yourself so seriously. Um, but I think there's so much benefit to it out in the community. And a lot of people who, might not otherwise take the time to go to a gallery or to a museum or to an art show would come to one if they knew that it would benefit their favorite nonprofit Mm. organization. And I just think it's a way to expand the art, expand the vision of the artists, provide a service. And, um, you know, that's kind of like my plan that I am going to be putting some of my energy towards in the next few months, just to see, you know, if I can take that somewhere. Um, That's awesome. I love that vision. Although I do think your biggest selling point was one of the first things you said was, I don't have to, th- I don't have to worry about my, think about my husband. And I think <laughs> thousands of people are now like, sign me up. I don't have to think about my husband. <laughs> yeah. Like, because, because, all right, those of you with spouses out there, don't you have this conversation? What do you think about dinner? And I have the same snarky answer. I think we should have it. What do you think? <laughs> you know, like every day. Yeah, I get it. We're going to have to eat three times a day. Am I the only one who thinks of like what the food should be? Come on. Like let's get some skin in the game here, buddy. And like that's you cool. make something once in a while. But, you know, that's um, maybe that's just my household. But anybody else? Anybody I'm else? the opposite of that. I'm cooking? the person in the household who doesn't cook. So I'm like, whatever you want, you go for it. I'll eat it. You can <laughs> You can put barbecue sauce on a boot. Uh, that's fine by me. If it's on a plate <laughs> and I have a sharp enough knife, I'm good. That's the problem is I'll make something and he'll be like, oh, I wish we were having something else. Oh, really? No, 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 let's, no. I say this. Let's make what, let's eat what you made. Uh, yeah, that's nothing. So here it is. Yeah, whatever. But yeah, but well, it would be nice to like for a whole week, just be like, there's, food over there. I can eat it when I'm hungry, whatever time that might be. I don't have to take anybody into consideration. Um, Go in my studio at whatever hour. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I mean, so. Well, he left now. Uh, Catherine's son, Michael, made a little appearance on video. I saw that. Also an amazing artist. So make sure you tell him that. Oh, nice. He makes his own little video tutorials. (laughs) That's um, do you have any other questions for Catherine or us, I suppose, about? Um, I So it was a one-year commitment or was it just you stayed for a year? Well, she moved. Yeah. yeah. If, so, if I, if I, if I, I know. How, mm-hmm. how dare she relocate? I, yeah, I understand your, you know. So most, so a lot of like arts and residencies programs have a defined period of time. And there are some arts and health programs that do use that model as well. Um, we're we're looking for people who want to work with us, you know, over the, over the long haul, you know, cause we, um, 
there's a lot of training and work that goes into, right. um, uh, yeah, the there's, work so, that we do I mean, that. it's a support, it, it's a support organization. So you're not going to train somebody and have them be there for two weeks. Like that's right. not what yeah. you're looking for. I understand. Yeah. I understand. That's why I was curious about it. I'm like, hmm. Yeah. And I, and I didn't know if it was a, you have a program and then you train people and then they go off into their own local goal. That is goals. the goal goals. eventually. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So eventually goals. <laughs> cause we, cause there's so many artists around the country that would love to do this work and that actually reach out to us on a regular basis. Like, how do I, how do I work with you guys? How do I do this work? Um, and we're still local to San Antonio um, but we know that there's a lot of desire and a lot of need out there to activate local artists to um, expand the work that they're doing in their local communities to include populations that wouldn't normally have access to the arts, people in hospitals, people with um, disabilities, people with brain traumas like you've worked with. Um, and so I would say people that are interested in learning more about the field of arts and health. Obviously, they can keep following our podcast, but they can check out um, the National Organization for Arts and Health. Um, they're a great resource. Um, and then follow us too, because we we are going to have things coming out um, at some point in the future. We can't, we don't have clear dates yet, but um, we do know that there there is a need for that to really activate local artists. Um, and, so yeah. and just, um, I mean, because people are listening, but money comes from somewhere to make this possible, right? So is it, are you a nonprofit and it's all donation? Are you supported by health organizations? Like, how does that work with you? Yeah. So like, like most arts and health programs, we're supported by a combination of individual donors, grants, and institutional support. Um, there isn't, these, these services aren't reimbursable um, within the context of a hospital. Like, it's not like, um, oh, you did a surgery and you get reimbursed this amount of money by the insurance companies. Um, there isn't a reimbursement mechanism yet. Um, so there's still a lot of need for philanthropic support of, of this type of work. Um, and if people want to support Heart Seed Art, you can go to heartseedart.org. I was just going to say, <laughs> get a plug in here, baby. <laughs> you can actually support, you can actually pick one of our artists specifically to sponsor, and then you get updates from them about the impact of the work that they've done um, um, each month. So, so anyway, yeah, that's a little bit about what we do. And I felt like it was a good opportunity to introduce that idea to you as well. Um, but if people want to learn more about you, oh, sorry, Richard. No, so I was just going to say, and because Catherine is itching to get off the camera outside <laughs> of here. So I just wanted to say that we uh, we also have uh, virtual programs. So you can go on our website, sign up with a, a Zoom session with Catherine and actually create art that way too. So mm -hmm. that's, oh, that's fun. She is yeah. still working. It's true. Yes. And doing art. Wow. She's, she's still Somebody. supporting people yeah. with health conditions yeah. and um, health care. trouble letting go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to keep her. We're keeping yeah. her. Okay. All right, yeah. but we're not going to keep her on camera because she would like to Bye, go Catherine. behind the scenes. Bye, Catherine, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. So, yeah, <laughs> unfair that we did that. <laughs> and how, if people want to learn more about you, Claude, how can people connect with you? Okay, so my website, very simple, ClaudeLarsonArt.com. Um, it's on the screen now. It's uh, Claude is C L A U D E. I'm French Canadian. Uh, Larson, L-A-R-S-O-N, art.com. Um, and yeah, there's a contact me form. You can see my work there. Um, there. I have a blog. I write, I will probably include this in a blog post. This has actually been a hoot today. Um, <laughs> we, we haven't have even created time. art yet. Oh, and I know. And I, I was going to say, and I have an activity I want to share, I but I, I brought some props, which I know some people are just listening to this on a podcast. So I will try to talk you through this. Um, but this is, um, and again, I am all about like, people are like, <laughs> they have these vision, like you're an artist and somehow you have easels and a palette of paint and you wear a beret and inspiration strikes like lightning and you're out in the landscape painting and like that it'd be lovely if that was my life <laughs> but it isn't my you know whatever i'm where i wear like grubby clothes and i am you know covered in paint and 
I don't worry about it. And I don't have, I, I have a very nice studio. I have a beautiful space. And when I say beautiful space, I mean large and organized. I don't mean like there's grand windows upon, you know, like beautiful landscape. No, there's none of that. It doesn't matter. But it doesn't matter because I'm so happy in my space. And she's away but from I, her husband. So that's all that matters. It, well, and it's funny because I used to be on the first floor and there were French doors. They were glass and they did not block out that much noise. And now I convinced him the room that we never used, we took all the workout equipment, put it in there. And I now have the whole basement. So I'm like, I'm on a different level. There's a solid wood door. It is my own space. And if it's, and if people are coming over and it's a mess, I don't care because it's not on the living. It's not like near the living area of the house. So, um, and sometimes they do want to see the studio and I'm like, okay, it's a creative mess. So as long as you're okay with that, come on down. Um, so anyway, I brought today a little activity that I have done with adults as the start of a workshop to loosen up. I've done it with my four-year-old grandson. So this is a great family activity, super simple, super inexpensive, and um, really, just really kind of a lot of fun. I like it myself. I make a lot of collage paper, and I also do this when I'm starting a painting if I want to make some marks so that I'm not staring at the big white canvas, as they say. Um, this is just a real easy thing to do. So I am starting with, this is a, um, just like, you know, you get the plastic containers. This, these are not like my good plastic containers that I would store food in. These are those ones that you buy um, if you were going to somebody's house and you knew you were leaving the container there, they sell them in like two and three packs. So I just have a container. It doesn't have to be particularly big or any particular size. Um, and I pour black ink in here or black acrylic paint. It, it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, the ink is relatively inexpensive, maybe a few dollars for a, a, a maybe four to six ounces. Um, you can also buy the black inexpensive paints that they sell in box stores. Uh, the idea is to get a, uh, I mean, I use black to start. You can get any color. If red lights you up, like buy red, it doesn't matter. But pour some paint into a container that you will never put food in again. Um, the other thing I did was, uh, like when I did this with my grandson, I gave him little hand clippers and we ran around the yard and I told him that he could pick anything in the yard and we were going to paint with that. So, um, you know, I found things like pine cones. Um, this was on a trip. I found these things on the ground. I have no idea what those are. It's like this hairy, spiky ball of, I, I don't know what it is. I'm not a botanist. Um, we take branches off trees. Um, you get like, uh, the grasses that'll grow like that little grass seed pod at the top. We picked those flowers, um, clumps of what, you know, berries. I live in a rural area, but really anything that you can cut with little hand clippers, we brought them in regular branches. We found some feathers um, that a bird had left for us very kindly. And we dip them in this container that would have black and or color of your choice, acrylic paint or ink in it. And then we painted with them. And now you can see I've cut these up because I've been using them in collage. So here was one that we made here was this is kind of like my favorite i'll hold this one up right and so all these shapes this was a clump of berries and i just kind of rolled it around on the paper and um the other one i can't reach at the moment and you think to yourself well this this could be a mess right but all of a sudden you just take, you know, buy a frame, cheap frame, get a mat in there. And all of a sudden you start looking around and you're like, you know, that's kind of interesting right there. You separate out a composition, black and white. You want to paint over it. You want to add color. You want to add shapes. You want to, 
you know, um, stamp a pattern with a bottle cap and just make circle, go ahead, you know, but, but you can sort of curate your way. I'll hold up another one. This one's pretty good. Right. Okay. And it's just about looking at composition. And this is just, um, you know, when you buy a frame, it'll come with an inexpensive white mat in there usually. This is just one of those mats. Oh, that's awesome. Right? And now all of a sudden, you're looking at what you made. And rather than looking at the whole thing, I don't even know if I can find a section in here. that would. Oh, there you go. But look at that. Like, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And, I mean, you want to talk about, okay, one plastic container and all natural materials that you can gather from a park, from near your home, uh, if you have trails or any of that near you, you just gather some materials. And the best part is you don't really know what it's going to do. And, I mean, at one point we had – some decorative grasses and it had this giant like it, I mean it was like this giant feathery thing at the top I don't know what to call it again not a botanist and like of course my grandson couldn't wait to go over and cut that down and he so now he has this like five foot tall stick with a feathery thing at the top well this was beyond exciting so of course I had the <laughs> I had paper. I had taped it to like a piece of cardboard. Hello. Anybody have an Amazon box at home? Um, so I had taped it and he like, he's painting with this like wildly. He had the best time. He could not wait because, you know, I was watching him while his brother was, um, his mom had to do something with his brother at school. And when his mom came, he was like, look at this. Like he was so excited and I took pictures of him like in the process. And I was thinking to myself, thank goodness we are outside. Because <laughs> it was crazy. Only like only a four-year-old. And I but I had said to her, dress him in something you really do not care about because he yeah, it might not come back in the same condition. <laughs> they, they know that pretty much every time the kids come over here because they always want to, you know, paint and do stuff. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so that's my super cheap, if a four-year-old can do it, and I have used it, I used it in adult workshop, and they were like, I have never done this before. And these were artists. These were like, some of them had degrees in art, and some of them had all kinds of training in art, and some of them were just, um, this is what I like to do, and so I paint. And they were like, I've never done this. I've never thought of doing this. And I said, well, I wanted to try new brushes. I didn't really want to spend a hundred and whatever dollars to find out whether or not I liked some of them. And I was like, what could I use instead? And I was like, oh, look at this, this, let's try this. And at one point I took a stick and I dipped the whole stick in there and I like rolled it across the paper and it just like it just makes crazy designs and the best thing about it is you don't know what you're going to get and then you get to stand back look at it and of course you're going to edit out i like this part i don't like this part throw a mat on there i mean very simple to to just do that and then if you want to if you want to paint over it paint over it you know like um add a color like black and white and red like that's pretty standard you know like and if you just want to have time with your family mm. you know time one you're outside there's no <laughs> i'm i'm very analog you know pre i, I love all the pre-internet ideas that run through my head like i don't need to google anything for that <laughs> I'm just gonna do this. um and you know you get them away from their devices and from screens and you spend time together and it's re it truly is art appreciation because I know we've all seen artwork where you look at it and you go I don't get it mm -hmm. right like um but this is now you've made it 
you got how it got made. It can only exist this one time because you, it was your movement, your gesture. It was this leaf or feather or pine cone or whatever you've gathered, right? It came from nature this one time. You're going to use it this way this way. Right. And I always, and I try to stretch them. Okay. If you're going to take a pine cone and you're going to roll it. Great. What if you took the bottom and like did it in a circle? What if you use the point of it, try to use it in, in a lot of ways or as many ways as you can think of, because it just expands your mind, opens up your creative process. And when I did this as part of a workshop for adults, they were, you know, you could just see the word, the wheels turning. Oh, just because it's a stick doesn't mean I can only do this with it. I could roll it. I could swoosh it. I could, you know, fling paint with it. And it it behaves differently than store-bought art materials. And then you end up with art that doesn't look like store-bought art, you know. it's um, I, I find it, it really fun, and it's still how I start a lot of my paintings. That's great. What a great suggestion and so accessible. Yeah. And thank you so much for taking the time to share your process with us and share something practical that our listeners can do. We're, it was great to have you on today. And thank if you, you do it, if you're listening or watching and you do it, make sure you tag us, take photos and tag us we on see. social media and we'll share those. And also, um, Catherine, can you please do that with Michael? Um, <laughs> We'd love to see Michael's work. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Right. How, how easy is that? And then they, but they start to appreciate it. And even at a young age, you know, they start to see what part of it they like and just like that compositional, you know, do they like harmony or discord or, mm. you know, all you, you can, you, it tells a lot, like, just like my panels with the people that I have worked with and they yeah. exhibit it in the gallery, it, what they pick and what they love is so in line with their personality. It's yep. really remarkable. That's awesome. Mm. Thank you so much for having me on today. This was a lot of fun. It was. Thank we you. had a great time. Um, and thank you for watching and listening. Make sure you subscribe wherever you're doing those things. We're back every week with new episodes and new people and new activities and new things to talk about. So thank you. Keep creating, everyone, and we will see you later. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Arts for the Health of It a podcast produced by Hearts Need Art, creative support for patients and caregivers in partnership with the National Organization for Arts and Health. You can help others learn about the healing power of the arts by subscribing, sharing, and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen or watch. The podcast is hosted by Richard Wilmore, co-hosted by Constanza Rader. Our theme song, Songbird, is written and performed by Natalie Lane. Visit heartsneedart.org to learn how you can support our mission to create joy with people facing life-altering health challenges. Join us next week to learn more ways you can create arts for the health of it. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Hearts Need Art, their staff, board members, or other affiliates. All content is created for informational purposes only. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice or to diagnose and treat any health condition. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health professional with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you heard on this podcast.